The last speaker of the day, and uh, a cyber security conference won't be a cyber security conference without some new scary threat. I don't know, I don't know, John Davies again, oh, okay. it's, it's the, uh, the conference uh, back here to provide this uh, presentation. John is uh, director of the software company, recently been recognised as one of the most innovative cyber security companies in the UK by Tech UK and Info Security Magazine. Uh, he having cut his teeth in the communications industry uh, with companies like MCI, WorldCom and Cable Wireless. He spent most of his 25 years in the IT security industry, worked for Giants, such as Gartner Group, as well as his venture capitalist back to startups. John, welcome to the stage. So, it's the hardcore. It's the people that have stayed right to the end. And so, and by the way, just in terms of people in the audience, who's got a hard stop here? Who's getting a train at about four o'clock? Yeah, okay, so a few of you have to say, I won't be offended. When it gets to the really exciting bits, which is the last three slides. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the other thing I can do, um, I can, I've got even small print at the bottom here that we were one of the most innovative cybersecurity companies. This was in a competition that was run. I'm going to leave you, actually, to decide whether this is true or not by the time I get to the, to the end slide. I've only actually got 48 slides, so, uh, so we should be in good shape. Okay, here's, um, here's the agenda in terms of what we're going to do. Am I pressing the right button? Maybe the right hand button. The right hand button. Oh, yeah. Right, I'm going to rattle through the evolution of DOS and DDoS. Hands in the air. Who's in cybersecurity in the room? Oh, see, that's brilliant. See these early slides? I'm going to fly through. So we're going to do the evolution of DOS. Then what we're going to do is we're going to see there was a change in the target with regards to DOS. Um, and actually this target was from layer, layer 3 to layer 7. Okay, those guys that just stuck their hands in the air and said they were from cybersecurity, hands in the air if you know what I mean by layer 3 to layer 7. <sighs> awesome. Okay, yeah, we are in pretty good shape. Um, then I'm going to introduce something about the dark net. The dark net's uh, a little bit of an off-topic subject in a lot of ways, but actually it's being used quite a lot with attack vectors at the moment, so we'll have a quick explore of that. And then we're going to look at the emergence. Um, we're going to look at the anatomy of one of those attacks. We've actually reverse engineered one. We've tested it. We know what it looks like. We know what it smells like. And I can show you exactly how it works. Um, and then, of course, we'll explore the absolute chaos of trying to defend against uh, invisible attacks and uh, the, the, the problems that's causing globally at the moment. Uh, I could kind of leave it there and just do more, no more with it, but that'd be a bit cruel. So, okay, right at the end, we will tell you how you're going to protect yourself from these attacks as well. Which is why all the guys are going to run out of the room for. Uh, will I get to that slide or not? Okay, so here's the start. Denial of service attacks. Everybody knows what these are. This is illegitimate traffic being bombarded into a system, so effectively it blocks legitimate traffic. Dead simple. It's a single source attack, and actually these days that's pretty easy to trace where that's coming from. It's a single target as well, um, and it's easy to identify. SIM systems, that's security information event management systems, log systems, they'll pick that up without any problem at all. In fact, these days, practically every firewall, even a 200 euro jobby you can buy from Maplins, will pick up these kind of attacks and will block the, block the IP address very simply. So, there's nothing scary about these attacks. We think of them as being in the domain of the script kitty. These are the, the little uh, school kids in their bedrooms at night trying to impress their mates. And actually, things like IP Stressor and JBooter, these are actually devices and tools, pieces of software you can download freely off the internet, and you can use YouTube videos to teach you how to do this. Yeah, it's really, it's really not hard. But a distributed denial of service attack, as the name implies, is lots and lots of people doing the same thing. Okay, so what you've got, multiple sources. Individually, they're easy to trace, but if there's a thousand of them, kind of you know, it increases the task a bit. Um, they're impossible to trace, by the way, if they're a botnet. Now, it's a robot network that's effectively somebody hijacking a whole bunch of other devices and using those devices to unwittingly launch these attacks. Uh, and this has made it absolutely impossible to stop these things uh, at source <laughs> and to identify the source. It's a single target again. Uh, SIM systems can spot these a mile off, so that's really not an issue. Uh, and they're difficult to block, except that there are now loads of services that are out there. You can now get services like the Akamai service or Cloudflare. These are effectively layers or uh, divert, where you divert the traffic into that, set of filters, scrubs it clean, sends it through. They'll pick up these kind of attacks. Um, this largest 
dis distributed denial of service attack launched to date that we know of was 400 gigabits per second of traffic. How big is your internet pipe? Yeah? <laughs> How many internet pipes could this thing, could this puppy just shut down and block? It's pushing 400 gigabits per second of traffic through a pipe, which means that your customers, your employees, your staff, etc., can't get at that, that pipe. Uh, so that was a pretty, pretty beefy, pretty meaty uh, attack. Uh, this, because of the technological advancements and because of the way this thing needs to be structured and the technology you need to pull this off, this is more in the domain of the hacktivist groups, the anonymous groups that are out there that take this seriously, and some of them are very well funded. Um, but what we saw recently, when I say recently, I, mean, I don't mean kind of in the last month or two, but certainly in the last couple of years, we've seen a shift away from this bombarding the network pipe. And we've seen a shift into attacking a piece of software. In this case, let's attack the web server itself. So, again, single source, easy to trace, it's not an issue, once you, once you see it happening, you can get at it. Uh, it's a single target, but now it's a software target. Sim systems are going to detect this as well, no problem. But it's pretty difficult to block because it wasn't attacking the hardware, it was attacking the software. Thankfully, Apache themselves managed to fix this one, as long with all of the firewall companies. Apache actually managed to fix it because they just put, a, they, they put an identifier in and now the software itself stops it, which is quite nice and other web, other web um, server software does the same thing. This was actually created by a guy called The Jester. And The Jester is a very famous character in the world of activism and, 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 and hacking and anonymous groups in general. The Jester actually uh, created some hacks called Xerxes, Pyloris, Sloros. Any of these ring any bells? Anyone in the room? No? Yeah, getting some nods. Uh, you can download these now. These are, these are free release. You can just get onto Twitter and ask for this and they'll give it to you. This is not hard. And uh, these, were, these were dubbed slow death attacks. So this is not about bombarding a, tra you know, tra a load of traffic down the line anymore. This is about attacking a piece of software and just hitting it at its handshake level. So when I do a handshake, I'll, I'll interrupt the handshake and hang it halfway through. Uh, so it's a, and it, they call a slow death attack because I'm going to build up the number of handshakes that I hang until eventually the box falls over. So, the dark net. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, the, the dark net, by the way, a dark net is called dark simply because the servers and devices on it can't be accessed by a, by a, a, a search engine. So the, there's lots of dark nets, there's not just one, there's a, there's a whole bunch of little dark nets out there. Um, the, probably the most popular one is the Tor network, it's called the Onion Router Network, which ironically was built by the American military. <laughs> we love it when that happens. So the, the US Naval Research uh, Academy actually built the Tor network originally because they wanted to anonymize traffic between each other and between their bases from anybody getting hold of who was saying what at any given time. Uh, and it's really taken off from there. Uh, the Tor network actually um, is a series of 6,000 relays that anonymize the traffic. They use a layer-based protocol to do this, and each layer only knows the next destination. Is, is everybody, who, who in the room is having a look at this and going, what? I'll just, very, very quickly, if this person sends the message to here, then this device knows the source and knows the destination. When it goes from here to here, this one knows the source, and knows the destination, but now loses that. When it goes from there to there, this one knows that one and that one, but doesn't know that one. Or do you see what I'm getting? So that kind of layer protocol means that as long as I can route my traffic through at least three routers or three relays actually on the Tor network, I'm anonymous. Dead simple. Slow, but simple. So that's the Tor network. And you can put servers on there. It's actually become the the, the, the ergo place to go for pornography, for weapons purchasing, for drugs purchasing. It's just the obvious place to go and trade now. And there are all marketplaces on there that make billions. So, if you've got the Tor network at your disposal, what you can now do is launch attacks out of the Tor network. So, again, these are going to be single source, but now they're going to be impossible to trace. So, the Tor network's a little bit dangerous when you get down to this. What we also start to see now is these layer 7 attacks are starting to attack pretty much any platforms, not just Apache. It's all of the web servers, certainly, and a lot of web applications are being hit. It's impossible to identify the new generation 
of attacks that we're seeing at Layer 7. So in March, our system picked up. Uh, our system, by the way, when I say ours, uh, for paid software, we're the monitoring and reporting solution. It's different from other monitoring and reporting solutions because it deals with every single data type in a single system. So it's normally in your infrastructures right now, in your SOX and your NOX, you've got a log system, just does logs. Uh, you've got config systems, just do config, etc. So we can put it all on one system. And our, our system picked up an attack vector uh, that wasn't showing any logs, but we were getting alerts that there was an attack. And what we were looking at was an attack vector that was in fact coming out of the Tor network. Uh, so it was impossible to trace it back, but it was also impossible to spot if your system was only looking for logs. Uh, and it's very difficult to block because it's got this slow death anatomy to it. Now actually, there was a new character emerged on the scene, not the jester, but another chap, and this chap called himself the Tor Reaper. They love, they love their names. Uh, and the Tor Reaper's uh, signature attack, if you will, he called the Dark Reaper attack. And now the Dark Reaper attack is invisible because of this. We grabbed hold of it, we reverse engineered it, we tested it in the labs, and we were able to replicate the exact attack, and we were able to have a play around with it. Uh, and this is effectively what was happening. So at, at a relatively high level, if you imagine somebody's going to log onto a server and say, hi, I'm a legitimate user and I'd like to... And what that's done, that's not severed the connection midway through a SYN you know, handshake, which is what the old, the old SYN flood and the old SYN, SYN, uh, SYN, SYN hacks used to do. This is actually a legitimate, uh, a legit, legitimate connection. What it's doing now is it's just drip feeding one byte at a time just inside the timer and sets up that really slow slow approach over that one connection. Then it launches another one and says, hi, I'm a legitimate user as well, and I'd like to. Now what you'll see here is on this little screenshot is you'll see that there are 257 processes running. When I say processes, these are actually connection counts. So these are, these are connection counting. And uh, the uh, connection count limit on an Apache server is 256. When you get to 257, the server falls over. But here's the really interesting piece. There's no logs. There are no access logs. Because an access log is only created when the transaction completes. The transaction hasn't completed. It's still sitting there going, ooh. And can do that, by the way, for up to 15 minutes per connection. So as long as I can get all 257 of them out within the 15 minutes, dead. The other thing it doesn't do is it doesn't launch any error logs. The server hasn't done anything wrong. The server's doing exactly what it was designed to do. So there are zero logs running here, nothing at all. So the sim system doesn't even know there's any activity, let alone there's any malicious activity, right up to the point where it falls over. That's a bit scary. So, if we just take a look at how this is being used, the Tor Reaper uh, <coughs> chat that we talked about, certainly the first person to, to use this Dark Reaper attack, and he actually claims glory for it on his Twitter account. Um, there's, uh, are you all familiar with ISIS, by the way, in Islamic State? Are you all familiar with the cyber caliphate? It's massive. They are an incredibly well-funded cyber organization. And they have a whole bunch of websites, they try and recruit, they're all very extremist, they go out and try and get people to jump on airplanes and fly over, you know, come over here and learn, you know, learn all the, the trade and help us on this mountain in the United States. Um, so that's what they do. Now actually, they, for, him, for example, use their cyber capabilities. They took down a French TV station, you will see that a few weeks back, a French TV station taken out because it said something naughty on a news item about, uh, about ISIS. They also took down an entire Australian university because it didn't let one of its students wear a burqa. That's the kind of thing the cyber caliphate can and will and indeed are doing right now. But fear not, there is a battle being waged. There are some anonymous groups out there that are actually in, at war with these people right now as we're sitting here. They're having these battles and they're battling it out in the cyber world. You can follow all of this action on Twitter yeah, seriously, I know, right? Social media, you don't love it. You can, all of this is on Twitter. Um, so you can see this battle panning out. You can see, you know, the, the ISIS people going, ha, ah, you know, we took down a, a, an anonymous group's attack site, and then you see an anonymous group going, tango down, we took down an ISIS attack, etc. Uh, so the anonymous groups are fighting back. Uh, and this is where we've seen this Dark Reaper emerge, actually. We saw it, we saw it as a spin-off of one of these attacks. 
This is a screen grab of one of the tools that, this, that a particular anonymous group, the group that we're talking about here is called GhostSec. And the GhostSec group, which is at war with Zyperconfig, they basically have a set of tools that they use on their systems. And this is a screen grab of one of those tools. So you can see here, this is Tor DOS, that's that Dark Reaper attack. Uh, you can see the website that it's shooting for here. And you can see that it's, can you see processes at the bottom there, 1,000 processes? So they ran 1,000 processes and took down this, uh, this particular website, which was an ISIS website. So that's a, that's a website. Tango down is their favorite phrase. They love that one. You always see tango down on their, uh, on their Twitter feeds. So there's one, there's another one. Uh, they're getting better at it here, by the way. You can see this one's gone down with only 500 processes. Uh, this one, this is beautiful. This particular web hosting piece here, this Py, Pyradler, whatever the rest of that address is, that's the actual hosting site that hosts the Cyber Caliphate website. <laughs> so this is their front web, this is their front door website saying, yeah, come on a plane, come over to you know, come over to Pakistan or wherever they, you know, wherever their camps are. They took down the actual website itself, it's a bit cheeky. Just have a look at the processes. They took down a website that theoretically is protected by millions of dollars of funding from, the, from ISIS, and they took it down with 270 processes. We said, I have 270 processes. I use a MacBook Air for my day job, and it does 4,000 processes at once. You can do 270 processes twice over with an Android mobile phone. That's really scary. These attacks are taking place via the Tor network. You'll never see them come. And an Android mobile phone can take down two websites without breaking a sweat. You could probably still make a phone call over it. So it's a little, yeah, a little bit worrying. But Here's where we're seeing this going. Because this is okay, right? This is, this is anonymous groups. They're, they're having a battle with ISIS. This is, this is white hat, black hat. This is good guys, bad guys. You know, who, who cares? You know, let them carry on. There, there are other uh, white hat, black hat uh, campaigns that run, by the way. We saw on Twitter once there was an anonymous campaign, ran for quite a while, against Denmark. Because, did you know, animal porn is not illegal in Denmark? Seriously. Uh, in fact, there are animal brothels in Denmark. Um, so they were attacking all of these sites, and there was a number of anonymous groups that were, that were going overboard on this. They hated that idea. And in the end, they stopped attacking the animal porn sites and actually attacked the government, the Denmark government themselves, and said, well, then you've got to legislate, because until you legislate, we're, we're not going to stop attacking you. And they did. About four months ago, it's now illegal in Denmark. So yeah, a round of applause for the good guys. But are they good guys? You know, just because they're taking down animal porn sites, and just because they're taking down, you know, ISIS sites, does that make them the good guys? Here we've got a great example. This was four weeks ago. This is Tor Reaper. Remember the guy who invented the Dark Reaper, and he's sitting there saying, the UK hosting company, UK2, is hosting an ISIS site, and we think they should, you know, they should remove it, so why don't we attack them? And the next thing we saw, was an attack appearing with Tango down, and sure enough, when you navigate to the UK2 site, it's offline. That's an entire hosting company hosting thousands of UK websites that are legitimate and could easily have been business critical, if not life critical websites. <coughs> Even worse, half an hour later, he's back on saying, oh no, no, hang on, my mistake. Yeah they, yeah, they are helping us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop attacking them. <laughs> Let them back up. So actually, not only is this somebody using this horrible weapon against an entire hosting site indiscriminately, he's also making a mistake. But here's the, here's the most interesting bit. Stop attacking it, please. He invented this hack. So this attack is his. So what does this tell us, this, this last sentence here? He's given it to other people. Now, that's basically Pandora's box. Once you give your super attack to someone else, you lose all control over what that person, those people, use that for. And that's dangerous. Now we're going to start to see where else are these, things, these attacks going to be launched from. There's another um, hacktivist 
don't know if any of you are familiar with him, a guy called Viking Dom. Viking Dom basically declared war on the United States of America. Bless his cotton salt. You know, and, and you've got to believe he lives there, right? Because only somebody that lives there is going to do that. He actually said, this is back in March, he actually threatened the United States as a whole. It was like the mouse that roared Phil. Did you all see that? Peter Sellers film. He attacked the entire United States. He said, I'm going to launch distributed denial of service attacks, and I'm going to bring down the American government, and I'm going to launch 1.8 terabytes per second. 1.8. Now, let's go back to the early slide. What's the biggest denial of service attack that we've ever seen? 400 gig. So how do we rate this guy's chances of launching something that's four and a half times bigger than that? And actually, after this warning and everything, we didn't, we didn't see a big denial of service attack at 1.8 terabytes. So nobody took him very seriously until he did this. He took down the Bangor, Maine, American government site. He also took down the TV station that reported on it and said that he was a bit of a bad egg for taking it down. <laughs> so he took them down as well. And he took down the visit Bangor main site because that was up and it was hosted on a different server and he didn't realize, so he took that down as well. He took this down using the Dark Reaper attack and he took all three of these down within a 15 minute lifespan. Literally, they were, they were just down. And he could keep them down you know, until they could resolve the issue. Every time they brought the server back up, he took it down again. A while later, took down Connecticut. So that's the Connecticut Gulf side. Others were dropping like flies. Then he hit the jackpot, took down the New York. So he's obviously jumping up and down, celebrating, etc. So far to date, he's taken down 39 out of the 50 state government websites, and he's still on the rampage. This is taking place as we speak right now. Now, this is just one user. We did a presentation very similar to this one at the Security and Policing uh, Expo in, uh, anybody go to that? Security and Policing Expo, law enforcement agencies, 75 countries, running in Farnborough. Um, yep, a few, few nods ahead. We were there. Did you see those Land Rovers and Range Rovers with bunker of glass? Really cool. Um, we did this presentation there and, and launched this, and three people came up to us afterwards from European countries, from the Ministry of Defense of one of those European countries, and a couple of other governments, and they came over and said, this particular Ministry of Defence, CISO, said, I nearly didn't come this week because we're under attack and all of our front facing servers are being hit. They've been hit for about five days now. We don't know what they're all on earth is hitting them. And I nearly didn't come because, you know, it's causing havoc. He said, but I booked my ticket, so I came in the end. I'm glad I did because this is what's hitting us. And, you know, that kind of attack taking place, those are government sites. Those are not just government websites. Those are front facing websites for government departments that are going all over the place. We've seen this being used on TV stations. We've seen this being used on corporates. So large corporates are getting hit by this if they are suspected of fueling or passing money in any way, shape, or form, or any kind of support to ISIS. They'll, they could get hit with this kind of stuff. And we're seeing more and more of it. So it's happening right now. Um, so how do you protect yourself? You guys haven't left yet. You know your train is really, you're very nearly going to miss your train. But this is the good stuff. Okay, so basically how to protect yourself. There you go. Basically what we've got here is a resource count. It's a connection count. So we're hitting a server, right? We're hitting a piece of software or software app. What we're going to do is count the connection counts. If you see the connection counts, you see them here in the space of one minute. It's gone from 126 connections to 181 connections. You should probably restart the server. It's that easy. Seriously. And in fact, if you've got the right monitoring system in place, you could probably set that up automatically to say, if this connection count goes over 200, restart, please. But I know, right? That's a bit of a letdown. I think you're hoping for something really, really groundbreaking there as a kind of a protection mechanism. But here's the question. Which monitoring system does this? Think about your own infrastructure for a second. Think about your own monitoring systems that you've managed to get some budget from the finance director to, to deploy. Which monitoring systems monitor connection counts or resource limits? Good, huh? Here's a bunch of uh, monitoring systems that you might have. So we've got log systems, uh, gathering logs, doing analysis on logs. If they've got clever correlations as a log system, they're called a SIM system, still using logs. Um, we've got configuration auditing files. You know, these are things like uh, tripwire. So you've got your arc site, you've got your log rhythms, log logic, your arc sites, your envisions, your tripwire systems, etc. You've got your performance monitoring systems like your SolarWinds or your cheap ones like PRTG or even your freebies like Nagios. 
uh, and you've got availability specific monitoring systems that might be going in at an application level. So, there's the clue. Where are the monitoring systems that do connection counts? Answer, not in the right place. You see the SIM system and the config system and all of the sexy stuff that's based on your security operations center. These are then all the expensive ones as well, by the way. You know, you know, you pay for a SIM, SIM system, you can easily spend a million pounds on a SIM system. A lot of money, you know, and a lot of time and effort and resource. If you start taking into the into account the salaries of the people who need to actually feed and water this beast, a lot of money on SIM systems. And they're in the SOC, they're in the security operations center. This is where your guys are specifically trained. They've done that horrible certification. You CISSP that takes about four years of your life and a six hour exam and turns your hair gray. You know, they've done all of that. They cost a fortune. CISSPs get paid 100 grand, right? Any CISSPs in the room? You get paid 100 grand? Yeah, yeah, of course. There you go. Yeah. And the reason for that is because you've got to be able to manage all four or five of these big systems and they're a right pain and you've got to do all that correlation. So this is all in the, in the security operations center, which is great, except these systems are not there. These are in your NOC. This is the network operation. This is the help desk. These are the guys that just pick up the phone when somebody's Microsoft password doesn't work anymore and say, you know, have you restarted the box? That, that's where these are sitting. That's where SolarWinds sits. So what you've got is highly trained security professionals whose sole purpose in life, when they're not eating toast, is to look for attacks, spot spurious activities, using millions of pounds worth of monitoring systems to do it. These attacks are invisible to their systems. They don't see them. Over on this side, there are systems that could do this if the system's got that enabled and it's been configured to look for it, but it's being manned by people who are not trained to do that and probably wouldn't spot it even if the system set off an alarm because they're trained to keep the lights on and keep the network flowing and to make sure that there's availability. They're not trained to look for attacks. So this is a really interesting conundrum. And we're seeing this already. If you look at the average duration of an APT. How long is it, average duration, for an advanced persistent threat, some of these little worms, to be sitting on a machine before anyone notices it's there? Anyone know what the average is? 18 months. 18 months? 18 months? Seriously, it's over 400 days. This is an attack that got past your quarter of a million pounds worth of monitoring already and is sitting on the system somewhere waiting to do its dirty work or it's sitting there already doing dirty work and you don't have the spotlight from your monitoring system pointed in the right place for 18 months. So the breaches are already there. If we've also got invisible systems running here, uh, then that's going to that's compound even, even more. So what we've got here now is this notion between SOC and NOC, and we are now seeing a huge trend in the industry. Gartner Group are bang, banging on about it. Forrester are banging on about it, basically saying, merge the SOC and the NOC. Bring these two sets of systems together give access to availability and performance monitoring to make sense. But that's a massive challenge for the existing vendors, but hopefully we'll soon start happening. Because this, as, a, as an attack, is incredibly dangerous. It's causing chaos all over the world right now. Um, and yet the solution to it is the simplest solution in the world. It's just in the wrong team. And in a lot of large companies, it's in the wrong building. And in some multinational companies, it's even in the wrong country. Or worse still, it's outsourced. So that's the landscape, that's the threat. Easy to solve if you know how. Uh, final plug for me is, as I said right at the start, uh, we are considered to be an innovative cybersecurity company because we invented a brand new database that can monitor all data types in a single system. Picking this up for us is an absolute piece of cake because we're not constrained to one data type like a SIM system. We can cross-correlate SIM with config, with performance, with availability, with file integrity, you know, even with number break recognition in the car park, everything is, is on one database for us, so we can correlate this very easily. So hopefully that was useful in terms of the landscape, the attack, uh, and um, the requirements here. As we see more attacks, obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll declare an announce and what have you, and we'll help with them. Uh, but are there any questions about that particular one? You're all stunned into silence, that's amazing. Surely the downtime on the rebooting the server just, uh, you, know, you, you now need to provide cloud load balancing and go yeah. scale up. To yeah, and try and, do, try and do that in a structured way so that there isn't any specific downtime on a single server. 
Any other questions? I guess it's fair for me to say that the solution to these attacks are all reactive. Um, how do you know that the Tor Reaper isn't working on something else? Yeah, I bet it is. I, I bet it is. And you know, when somebody passes a piece of source code over to a script kitty, and these are just grown up script kitties at the end of the day, these anonymous guys, they don't sit there and go, ooh, that's nice, and then use it like it was an out of the box product. You know, it will have been stripped down, rebuilt, reconstructed, changed. So we just know they're going to be derivatives. Is it fair to say that we'll never be in a position where we could be proactive? I think in terms of, this is back to this prevention you know, and detection methodology, or can we actually do something proactive that it immunizes us from these kind of attacks? And I think the problem you've got is that it's, you, you, you're probably not going to be able to immunize yourself from attacks like this, um, you know, cheaply and cost effectively. As we just said, it's a great, great suggestion there in terms of load balancing will solve the problem. You know, they're going to keep hitting it, but now we can load balance, and therefore the effect of that damage is being noticed. Uh, and we see Akamai responding with their scrubbers. So in theory, we've got kind of immunization shots that, that, are, that are out there. These aren't cheap pieces of kit. You know, you're not going to get your average small business or even a medium enterprise rush out and buy an F5 box and take an Akamai subscription. So I think the challenge here isn't necessarily the challenge for the really big players who can throw money at it to, to immunize themselves from these kind of things. It's more further down the food chain, it becomes a real problem. And of course, further down the food chain means your supply chain. Excellent. So once again, you're probably not the primary target. You know, you'll just buy Akamai and you're done. But your 1,000 suppliers are not necessarily going to do that. And if they can get in with a DOS attack, what else could they get in with? What else could they get in with using the DOS attack as a diversion? Um, which is obviously where we see some of these advanced persistent threats getting through under diversions and under restarts. You know, the best thing for an APT hacker is a restart, right? <laughs> So if I can set somebody up so that they have to restart their server every 15 minutes because you know, they're being hit by the, the Dark Reaper, every 15 minutes they're downloading another rootkit. That would be brilliant. So I, can, I, can you immunize? Probably not. Uh, can you detect? Yes. Can you protect the big boys can? The poor little companies probably can. It's not a good answer. <laughs> John, are you seeing this used for um, financial gain rather than just we want to take your server down? So yeah, that, that would be really interesting, wouldn't it? I mean, we've got Boris, um, you know, good old Ivan, whatever his name is, the guy that's uh, on the FBI most wanted. He's the guy that invented the uh, I'll, I'll block your website unless you pay me 300 euros. And um, it, he's, he's estimated at $100 million. He's, uh, he's in the FBI's top, top 10. You know, that, that, that's a 300 euro business that's turning over, you know, that's managed to get over a period of time $100 million. So, but it kind of take him seriously. If he started using these kind of attacks and this kind of technology to do what he does, he's not attacking a 300 euro site anymore. You know, he, he, could, he could take down British airspace and then keep it down until they paid him a little bit more than 300 euros. Surely the other answer is that the software community who builds the software, Apache, which is open source, building timeouts and proper yeah. uh, hardening of these algorithms. That's where the fight lies. Yeah. And I, I, I think actually, possible to scale that. You're absolutely right. It's the time scales for these companies to respond. You know, this attack, we saw this attack in March. Beginning of March, we saw this. And, you know, they're, they're still working. The Apache community could harden that, you know, in a week. I mean, yeah. that's a normal catch. And, and yet. Why are they not motivated? Well, exactly right. And, and, and I think it's the speed of seeing these big systems turn around and, and do something. Look, you could say the same about you know, Microsoft and its IIS platform, because that's just as well. And you know, how quickly is it going to take them to fix that? In the meantime, as the first question we got, somebody else has picked up Dark Reaper and is altering it and changing it, and so it's going to be slightly different by the time Apache fix the first one. So it's a, I, think that, I think that's going to be the, that's the perennial challenge. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's constant, that goes on in the background all the time. Yeah. Any other, thank you, Carl. Any other questions? Good, I'll, I'll be lingering, I'll be hanging around for those of you that I'm going to train to rush off to. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.